In the name of Jesus Christ and on behalf of the First Congregational Church of Watertown, I welcome all of you to this service of worship this morning. This is our first time being back in person for worship since last fall, and we are so glad that you're here with us today. We are a congregation that welcomes people of diverse backgrounds, faith experiences, and orientations. So no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, whether you're here in person or worshiping with us online, you are welcome here at First Church. You will notice that there are a few things a little different than how we have done them in the past. Um, and that's because we're still emerging from the pandemic and figuring out what our new normal is going to be. Uh, we are asking people to wear masks when we worship indoors, and this is to protect the children and anybody else that might still be vulnerable. Uh, our service is being filmed. It will be edited and posted each week so that we can continue with this uh, very robust online ministry that we developed over the time of the pandemic. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, outreach ministry, and we're glad to be able to continue it. And my thanks especially to Jim Gowell and his crew uh, that are here uh, helping make that possible. We still can't sing indoors yet. Um, however, uh, Claudia is going to sing the hymns for us, and we can certainly, we will be standing during the hymns, and we can hum along uh, with the hymns. We're hoping to be able to get back to congregational singing very soon. So my thanks also to the Bell Choir, who is going to be providing music for us today, and uh, to Eric Trudell, our music director. So we do have music. It, it, we will get back to full normal before too long. Uh, there won't be an offering plate passed back and forth during the moment for generosity. There are offering plates available at each entrance if there's something you'd like to contribute, but we really encourage you to continue with your online contributions. Um, that's been a real uh, step forward for us, and we want to continue that. At the end of the worship service, uh, unless you need the ramp, we're asking everyone to exit through the front doors of the church. We will have refreshments and uh, social time out in the courtyard. We're really looking forward to being able to do that again. So I would ask you to turn to your bulletin. We're going to rededicate the sanctuary for public worship. Brothers and sisters in Christ, due to the COVID-19 pandemic that we have all been going through, we've been forced to suspend in-person worship in order to keep everyone safe. This was not an easy decision to make. This sanctuary has always been a place to discover and deepen our faith, to build memories, and to be together in Christian love. This is the space where weddings, Baptisms and funerals have been held for hundreds of years. This is a space for civil conversation, for planning, and for discernment by the people of God. Most importantly, however, it is a place where we exercise the privilege to worship freely, praising the one and true God who redeems us through Jesus Christ. We acknowledge that our hearts have been heavy because we missed in-person worship in this space. We missed the fellowship of friends, we missed live music in our weekly routines. So today, with great joy and thanksgiving, we rededicate this space as a place for public worship, for conversation, and for blessing. We recommit ourselves to the work and ministry to which we are called by God, and we give thanks to God who has brought us through a terribly difficult passage into the light and hope of a future reimagined. In this place, we will bear witness to the light of Christ. Jesus Christ. Through the grace of God. 
In this place, we will receive the promise of God's blessing. And God's love and into our hearts through the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 In this place, we will share the feast of salvation. In Christ, we will honor and thirst no more, and God will wipe away every tear. Holy God, you have called us to be your church in this place. Help us to be a light in the world, to share the good news we have received, to pour out the gifts of your spirit, and to feed others as we have been fed so that all people may know the fullness of life that you offer through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Baptism with water and the Holy Spirit is the mark of their acceptance into the care of Christ's church, the sign and seal of their participation in God's forgiveness, and the beginning of their growth into full Christian faith and discipleship. Together, church, parents, and sponsors enter into a covenant with God that lifts up our commitment to raise this child in the Christian faith, to support her and her parents, and to witness to the truth and power of the gospel in all we do. I would like to invite forward Mila Pamela Bowles and her parents, Elijah and Kara, her sponsors, Joseph and Andrea. Is there your desire that this child be baptized into the Christian faith? It is. Will you encourage her to renounce the powers of evil and the worship of self and to embrace the love of God as she grows into maturity? We will with God's help. Do you promise through the grace of God and by your life and teaching to lead her toward a growing understanding of the Christian gospel and into the service of Jesus Christ? We do. Will you endeavor, God being your helper, to guide and instruct her that she may be led to the confession of Jesus Christ as sovereign and savior of the world, to the communion of Christ's table, and to confirmation into responsible membership in the church? We will. 
Will you yourselves take an active role in the life of Christ's church in both worship and service? We will. As sponsors of this child, do you covenant with their parents, with her parents, to do all you can to assist them in the fulfillment of their vows? In God's name, we do so. Sisters and brothers of the household of faith, I commend to your love this child, Mila, whom we celebrate as uh, a member of God's family. Will you be the kind of church that will encourage her to grow in the knowledge and love of God, our Savior, Jesus Christ? Will you support those who seek to guide this child in the way of the gospel and to faithful service in Christ's church? Let us pray. Most holy God, who of your infinite mercy and goodness has promised to be our God forever, we pray that you bless this child with your spirit as we baptize her according to your word. Bless this water as well, that it may be a sign and seal of new life in Christ. Amen. Do you come see me? Mila, Pamela, I baptize you in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Mother and Father of us all. Amen. Oh, she fell my <laughs> Now, normally I would take this child and bring her up and down the aisle and introduce her to you as your new sister in Christ. Uh, she has not been vaccinated nor have uh, the youngest among us, so for today I'm going to have to ask you to gaze upon her from a distance. But she is your new sister in Christ, and we have promised her and her parents, as we did with her big sister, Avalon, to wrap her in God's love, to teach her Christ's way, and to welcome her into this fellowship. And we couldn't be happier. She's thinking about it. <laughs> we give you thanks, O holy God. You are the mother and father of all the faithful. We thank you for this beautiful child and the grace acknowledged here today in water and the Holy Spirit. Embrace us all as sons and daughters in the one household of your love. Grant us the grace to receive, nurture, and befriend this newest member of the body of Christ. We pray that you give to her strength on her life's journey, courage in the time of suffering, the joy of faith, and the freedom of love, and the hope of new life in Jesus Christ who makes us one. Amen. We have several gifts for you. We have her baptismal certificate and a children's Bible. We also have a, a blanket uh, made by our prayer shawl group and a flower. And uh, give these to you. Hopefully, uh, you'll be reading that Bible with her often. Oh, yeah. but, uh, thank you so much. As we enter into this time of prayer. I would ask that you please keep Clarence Lystring in your prayers. He's dealing with a, uh, a medical issue at the moment and uh, we want uh, the best for him. We ask for God to surround him with light and love. And we enter together as the people of God into prayer as we do each week, whether we have been here in person or at home, lifting up to God our cares and our concerns. So let us be together now in the spirit of prayer. We acknowledge, O oh God, that our global community has been irrevocably impacted by a virus so small we cannot even see it. We have lost so many souls in this country and abroad. They will forever be missing for birthdays, Christmas, Easter, anniversaries, and baptisms. We acknowledge that as a people, we haven't always agreed on how to deal with the pandemic, masks, restrictions, Public policy and business have all become points of contention as we wrestled with our grief, fought to protect our rights, wonder about the future. We have experienced being tired, bored, and anxious. And yet, oh God, especially at this moment, we are hopeful. You have brought us through and kept us together. Through advances in technology that allow us to worship, through advances in science and medicine which bring us vaccines, through your presence in and through and 
in spite of all we have suffered. We are overcoming this difficulty while striving to remain faithful to you. You remind us that all your people, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, orientation, economic status, and citizenship, deserve the right to medical care, services, and relief. Through it all, your message of Christmas remains the same, that Christ is born. The message of Easter remains the same, Christ is risen. The promise of Pentecost remains the same. The Spirit of God is with us as we go into the world to share the gospel. Even when we falter, O oh God, you are faithful. You keep your promises to love us, to keep us close, to reveal your will to us in the teachings, ministry, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are your people, O oh God. Bless us so we may bless others with the love that you share, with the light that you bear, with the hope that sees us through. In the name of Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Savior, we lift our voices together in prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the glory, and the power forever. Amen. During the pandemic, we began to focus especially on what generosity means for us as people of faith. We recognize that God is generous with us every day, showering us with love and blessing in abundance. As a congregation of people who follow the resurrected Christ, we strive to reflect his love in our interactions with each other and with those in need in this community and beyond. Your generosity through your financial support, your volunteer time, your energy, and your prayers allow us to strengthen the ministries that we have so that we can serve. Every time we become the hands and the feet of Jesus in the world, we bless others, and we experience blessing as well. So at this time, I'm going to offer a prayer of dedication for all the ways in which we give and all the ways in which we practice generosity. Let's be together in prayer. God of blessing and promise, accept the wide variety of gifts we humbly offer. Use them and use us to reach into places where your mystery remains hidden your goodness is not yet known. Make us good stewards of your resources and generous in our outreach. Bless all that we do in the name of Jesus Christ.
1 through 5. These are Paul's words. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. May God's blessing be added to our hearing and understanding of these holy words. Let us be together in prayer. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Some years ago, I knew a woman who received terrible news. She had been diagnosed with cancer. At only 47 years old and with a spouse and five children to support, she was going to have to take a leave of absence from work and engage in the fight of her life, a fight for her life. There were several different stages she went through, as you might imagine. She was defiant. I will beat this for sure. She was angry. Why did this have to happen? She was scared. What if something happens to me? She sought control, researching treatment options, taking supplements to strengthen her immune system, and faithfully following her doctor's recommendations. In several of our conversations, she wondered aloud about where God is in all of this. She wondered if God is all-knowing, all-powerful, and is creator and ruler over all creation, then why do people get cancer? I didn't have an adequate answer. I'm not sure anybody does. Many of us try to comfort those who suffer by saying things like, well, you know, there's a reason for everything. Or, when God closes a door, God opens a window. Or even, God won't give you anything that he and you can't handle together. I've seen that one on a plaque. Some find it helpful to get them through difficult times. But none of those responses were appropriate. There simply wasn't a reason that this woman got cancer. She fought long and she fought hard, and after a courageous journey down an arduous road, she received the wonderful news that she was in remission, and we all rejoiced. But I have to say she wasn't the same person coming out of this experience as she was going in. She had been changed by it. Physically, she will bear the scars of her surgery forever. She's missing a part of her body which for women is so important to our identity. She doesn't have the same stamina she once did. And her hair is different than it used to be. But spiritually, she's also different. She said to me, I'm not the same. I don't see God the same. I don't have the same expectations when I pray or when I see others going through difficulty. I used to think I must have done something wrong, but now I understand that everyone goes through things. I used to expect God would cure me if I just prayed hard enough, but now I see that God was with me the whole time, no matter the outcome. When I asked her what she felt helped her to get through it all, she said, my goal was to survive. I have a family that needs me. I have a job I love. But more than that, I felt that God still has a purpose to be fulfilled in and through my life. You can't get rid of me yet. I'm not finished. This woman is an inspiration to me. She's someone I regard as resilient. She's able to face into a difficulty and not only survive, but thrive. This doesn't mean she had an easy time of it because she did not. She didn't come out of it the same as she went in. She's different in ways that on one hand are difficult, but on, other, on the other hand are amazing. She's developed a certain big picture outlook, that 30,000 foot look, uh, as they said. She created a workable strategy to follow. She learned to manage her expectations, and she cultivated important resources and support. All of that enabled her to take this challenge on and to overcome it one step at a time. But perhaps most importantly, she relied upon God for strength. 
Now, in 32 years of work in ministry, I can tell you that not everyone has this same kind of resilience. I've seen some hit roadblocks because they want answers that won't come, like why suffering exists. Some expect that by being on their good behavior, they might somehow skirt difficulty, as if suffering is some sort of punishment. And some become angry, bitter, and lose hope altogether. I think we know that all of us, every one of us, goes through difficulty of some time, uh, of some kind, that might threaten our well-being, try our patience, and make us question what the heck God is up to. We may not always be able to find the answers we seek about why we go through certain things, but research shows that those who seek the support of family and friends, those who endeavor to stay positive, those who remain adaptable, and those who persevere generally fare better. But it's also true that those who cultivate a meaningful relationship with God do better in the long run and find greater meaning in what they've gone through. This doesn't mean that we succumb to trite cliches that offer comfort by saying that God somehow planned our injury in order to teach us something or to make it possible for blessings to come. I don't believe for a minute that God causes suffering. But it is true that our faith can help us see how God is with us in all circumstances. Our faith increases our awareness that even in the midst of difficulty and tragedy, good can come of it. When we rely upon our faith, we become more open to seeing and loving God in deeper and more profound ways. We learn to focus not so much on how difficult it was or getting specific answers, but by living into the very real presence of God in our lives, appreciating the blessings that come in spite of our suffering. Now, this approach can be helpful when a community or a whole nation goes through difficulty. As we traverse this horrible pandemic, our congregation, like so many others, had to endure a challenge we never thought possible, never mind planned for. As far as we know, this was the first time our church, in our church's history that we were unable to meet in person for worship for an extended period of time. Although we didn't actually close the church, we were forced to close the sanctuary in order to keep people safe and comply with the various orders to stay home. As you might expect, there was a wide range of responses, opinions, and emotions expressed by members and friends of our community. Understandably, people were missing the regular habit of coming to church on a Sunday morning. Being able to worship together, to sing together, to enjoy fellowship together, to learn about our faith, and to serve the community are like a lifeline for so many of us. Understandably, many were grieving the things we loved and had to do without for so long. Others were angry that we closed the sanctuary, citing examples of other churches who were doing this or doing that and seemed to be open. Some argued the guidelines, pointing out inconsistencies and a sometimes lack of clarity. And a few even insisted that going to church would be okay because Jesus would protect us. I understand all these reactions. But honestly, the most frustrating thing for me as your pastor was hearing of a couple, uh, of a few people who left because they didn't like the way we were doing things. I will say, we are blessed, though, that as a whole, our congregation showed great faith and wonderful resilience in the face of this pandemic challenge. Our incredible lay leaders pulled together and worked with me and with the staff to navigate our way through this whole mess. Some did the work of researching guidelines and recommendations so that we could write and then rewrite policies for us to be able to use. Some made calls and sent cards and delivered meals to those who live alone or were feeling isolated. And many learned to use technology that was new to them, like email or Zoom meetings or online worship. If you're fluent in those things, you take that for granted, but there were those who stepped up to that scary challenge and mastered it. We did this together so that we would make it through. And as a result, we have walked successfully through this pandemic, and we are emerging on the other side. But we are not the same as we once were. In many ways, we are even stronger and more faithful than before. For example, while we are here worshiping in this sanctuary, 
Even more people will be worshiping online with us later on, uh, maybe later today or tomorrow or even during the week. This is possible because we adapted to the changing needs for worship and will continue to do so moving forward. We welcomed new leaders to step forward, to share in the work, to share their skills, to support the church as we figured out our path. We figured out ways to reach out while maintaining social distancing and wearing masks. Food deliveries, collections, and more were done in new ways. And we learned to let go of petty concerns and to focus on a bigger picture. Who are we as the people of God and what are we doing here? What really matters as a church and how does God call us to serve? What we came to understand is that reliance upon God in all circumstances increases our resilience and gives us a better outcome in the face of a challenge. We learned we cannot simply ask, what am I going to get out of coming to church? We've begun to embrace a higher vision of what it means to be the church. We're not here for our own entertainment, but for something more. We have a witness. We have a testimony to share. The living God, the resurrected Christ, is alive and here among us. We are called to treat one another with Christ-like love, with respect, and to offer an inclusive welcome to all God's children. We are part of a wider community that needs us. And we're not done with this work yet. We're still adjusting and figuring things out. We know we cannot go back to what was, but instead we will carve a new path going forward. God has done a wondrous thing in and through the person of Jesus Christ in this church, even in a pandemic. And we are called to share that good news. God is not done with us yet. I recall the words of Teresa of Avila who said, Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. You are the eyes through which he looks with compassion upon the world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes, yours are his body. Christ has no body on earth but yours. I pray that God will continue to bless us as we recommit ourselves to this ministry, as we strengthen our resilience and our resolve, and as we go out into the world to share the gospel of Jesus Christ.
We give you thanks, O holy God, for bringing us forth in the beauty of your creation, for blessing us with your presence in our lives, and for showing us your love, mercy, grace, and peace through your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask that you forgive us when we stray and turn from you, forgetting that all we have and all we are come from you, the source of all life. In this, our sacred meal, we remember the life, teachings, death, resurrection, and eternal victory of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, through whom you came to us to reach out to us, to offer us salvation, and to bring us to you through the gift of eternal life. We ask that you bless these simple gifts of bread and the cup, and that your Holy Spirit would alight on us as well, so that in our time together and apart, we may serve you by serving others. We remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion, Jesus took the bread, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Ministering to you in Christ's name, we now partake of the bread. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and drink this. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the remission of sin. As often as you drink it, remember it, remember me. Ministering to you in Christ's name, we now take Let us pray. We give you thanks, O holy God, for the gift of our Savior's presence and the simplicity and splendor of this holy meal. Unite us with all who are fed by Christ's body and blood, so that we may faithfully proclaim the good news of your unending love, and so that we may be the body of Christ at work in the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray.
blessing. May we go in grace and peace to be the hands and feet of Jesus to heal a broken world. May we go in grace and in peace to love the world on behalf of Jesus, bringing hope to a careworn world. May we go in grace and peace to discover the joy of doing the work of Jesus, our risen Savior. Amen.